right, so I want to use today as an opportunity to go through and start talking about um, plant families uh, a little bit and the arrangement of hypothesized evolutionary relationships among those families. What we're looking at here, this first web page here, is the web page for the angiosperm phylogeny group, which keeps uh, frequently updated phylogenies for major plant groups. So on this first screen here, which is the, the major tree for seed plant uh, orders, um, you can see that, um, and actually most vascular plants here, uh, you can see we have ferns, we have ginkgos, pines, um, all of these guys, uh, cycads, those are all clustering out in our first group. So when we're talking about angiosperms, we're pretty rapidly talking about the bottom portion of this tree and we're ignoring the first uh, five groups or so here, or we're not, that's not uh, our interest within angiosperms. You'll notice the next group to branch off here is what's called the uh, magnoliids. And the magnoliids represent what we think are, have the traits of what we think are uh, more primitive angiosperms, flowering plants. So for example, let's take a look in, inside uh, Magnoliales, and we'll go actually to the family Magnoliaceae. Early in the spring, uh, Magnoliaceae is one of the first uh, street trees to bloom, and so you may see some of that. These pages tend to be very uh, text heavy, but they're really nice to go through and kind of explain uh, what's going on within each of these main groups. And there's usually a, um, uh, another phylogenetic tree within the page that will tell you about the relationship with individual families. Let's, uh, we'll take a look at uh, Magnoliaceae in particular. Magnoliaceae is distributed all around the world. And the traits of Magnoliaceae flowers are really nice to look at for an example of what we think primitive or early evolution angiosperm flowers might have looked like in that the number of parts are not as distinct as we're used to seeing in many other angiosperms. So for example, here's a common, um, here's a very common uh, flowering plant that we see a lot as a street tree. Uh, Magnolia stellata. Magnolia stellata has an undifferentiated large number of petals, it has a large number of stamens, and it has a large number of uh, stigmas or ovaries. And so instead of being specific about those numbers, they're just large numbers of everything. Um, so that's very typical of what we see in the Magnoliaceae. Um, you'll also see this with your evergreen magnolias, which are more common in the south, but also again as street trees. So again, we have large numbers of petals, large numbers of stamens, and uh, large numbers of female reproductive parts as well. Other members uh, within these groups are gonna have characteristics that are slight rifts uh, or slight variations on that general theme, large numbers of flowering parts in the typical flower. Then you'll notice our monocots are actually hypothesized here to come off next. This is a whole group that traditionally has been thought of as the more advanced plants. We'll get into them later. We're gonna skip down to our core dicots. And the first families that I wanna focus on are gonna be our core dicot families. And then we'll come back to our monocot families later. Within our dicots, we can start looking at families that have traits that are very similar to what we find in um, the Magnoliaceae. Um, since those, especially in your Flora of the Pacific Northwest, these are generally gonna be closer to the front of the book. Here we are in Flora of the Pacific Northwest, and we're gonna start at page 77. This is where the U dicots really start. U dicots meaning kind of the true dicots. And you see the first family that we're looking at is the Papaveraceae, or the poppy family. And it's worth cruising through that and just looking at some of the genera that you would key out in the poppy family. It's also worth, worth kind of flipping through the pages and looking at the traits of flowers that you're going to find within the poppy family. And you'll notice that for some of our common species and genera, like this one, the California poppy, 
The flower itself is composed, you can see in the image, of, um, well, it's only going to have four petals, and the sepals are going to be somewhat reduced there, or absent, or deciduous, actually. Um, then we will have um, a high number of especially um, male flower parts. So if we read the description for this, you'll see stamens 12 to numerous within this genus. And so like in Magnoliaceae, you see that we tend to have an undifferentiated or very large number of flower parts. The petals now, unlike Magnoliaceae, which had a, a high number of petals, our petals are reduced to four within this group. And our sepals are actually reduced to two um, that are shed as a unit. And you'll see this uh, when you look closely at poppies as they start to flower out in our region in waste areas. And the stigmas will be four to eight lobes. So we still have a large number of stigmas, but not as many as we have stamens. Flipping down further, another family that has characteristics of high numbers of flower parts is the ranunculaceae. So this is the buttercup family. You'll find the flowers within ranunculaceae tend to be actinomorphic, meaning they're radially symmetrical, but they can occasionally be bilaterally symmetrical, and there are some really showy examples of that in the family. The sepals can be from three to six. They're often distinct. They often look like petals. And the petals um, tend to be somewhere between mostly five, but occasionally much larger than that. Uh, or they can even be absent or conate, as you'll see especially in some of our zygomorphic or bilaterally symmetrical flowers. They tend to be gland-bearing, which is an uh, uh, important characteristic. Uh, anemones are an example of an actinomorphic member of this family and an actinomorphic member of this family that has that large number of flower parts that is typical of plants in this portion of the angiosperm phylogeny. So you'll see that represented by specific species and specific genera within this family. And you can see it in some of the images here where we have large numbers of stamens. Within this early part of the book, Another really interesting group is the Saxifragaceae. This is a family that you're going to see frequently trailside in the Pacific Northwest. One thing that's typical of the Saxifragaceae is you tend to have an ovary that is divided into two compartments with two really uh, obvious and distinct stigmas. You see this especially in garden uh, horticultural varieties, but you can see it in many different members of the species. And often in a uh, flower in the Saxifragaceae, you'll see the ovary divided like this. Sometimes in the Saxifragaceae, you will have a ovary that is starting to look either partially or wholly inferior, as you can see here, where the ovary is starting to be buried below the other flower parts. Um, as we get closer to Rosaceae, you'll see that that is more and more common. But we still have occasionally large numbers of uh, flowering parts. So, for example, as we read down here, we can see the petals are as many as the sepals, sometimes fewer are lacking, so that does happen. But the stamens are generally five or ten, and sometimes occasionally between two and nine. But they can be twice as many as the petals. And so rather than being just in fives, they're in tens. The Saxifragaceae tends to be in fives other than those ovaries. Another family that's fun to look at and familiar to some of you is the Crassulaceae or stone crop family. These are really interesting flowers uh, that are interesting to, to look at. They can be anywhere from three to eight mirrors in uh, the flower parts. The sepals tend to be conate and the petals are um, sometimes very showy. The stone crops are our sedums or our rock mat plants. Um, our stamens tend to be twice as many as petals. So again, when we look inside an individual flower, we're gonna see a large number of stamens, 
uh, but it should just be twice as many as the petals. So we should be looking at around 10 and they might alternate with uh, one being up against the petal and one being in between individual petals. That's a fun family to look at. It may surprise you to run across the Fabaceae close by. Uh, Fabaceae tend to be zygomorphic fam uh, flowers in our region with a clear banner wings and keel, a typical pea flower. But not all Fabaceae flowers are like this, just many of them. So here's a typical banner wings and then a keel in the center um, Fabaceae flower here in the, in the key to Astragalus. Fabaceae has many um, obvious and really interesting genera and some giant um, large genera. Astragalus is one of those. If you have something in the genus Astragalus, it's going to be a very long key. There are several other groups in here that are also large uh, genera. Another thing that's typical of the Fabaceae is they tend to have leaves with distinct leaflets. Um, think of mimosa or uh, vetch leaves. So it's worth flipping through and taking a look at who can be there. There are some flowers within this group that are actinomorphic rather than zygomorphic. So note that while this is the typical pea flower, uh, that's not always the case for everything in the Fabaceae. Sometimes they look a lot more like a radially symmetrical flower. And then finally, the Rosaceae. And Rosaceae are really interesting flowers. They're really interesting to... Um, to key out and they have some familiar characteristics and one of them is that they tend to uh, have the ovary forming in kind of a, like a saucer-like um, uh, hypanthium. And so we tend to have petals coming off of that, typically five petals, uh, numerous stamens is typical, and sometimes numerous other flower parts. Um, so the calyx tends to be five mirus. Uh, the petals tend to be, they can sometimes be four, but most of the time they're five. And the stamens are few occasionally, you know, they can be few, but more often in my experience, I'm going to find them numerous. Often born with petals on the calyx, and the pistils can also be one to numerous. So again, we're kind of like back to that original uh, Magnoliaceae situation where we have a lot of uh, flower parts in the case of stamens uh, and in the case of female parts as well, uh, pistols especially. Um, so all of these families have some characteristics of um, those Magnoliaceae type flowers, but now we're in the core dicots, and these are all close together in Florida the Pacific Northwest. So that's some of the first families within Flora of the Pacific Northwest. One last closing note, we're looking here at the hypothesized relationship for uh, major groups within angiosperms and within most vascular plants. We talked about several families that are within Flora of the Pacific Northwest uh, near the beginning of the book that are common families. There are many others. Two things to keep in mind. First, take your time going through the book and going through these families, either here on the Angiosperm Phylogeny Group website or in the book itself. Taking time to glance through and familiar, familiarize yourself with the names and uh, images of flowers and plants within these groups will make it much easier for you out in the field to quickly recognize uh, families, individual genera, individual plants in a way that'll make it faster for you to key things out. Second, it's good to keep in mind that this is a hypothesized grouping or hypothesized uh, phylogeny for these plant groups. It's not absolute. Flora of the Pacific Northwest within angiosperms largely sticks to the angiosperm phylogeny, uh, phylogeny groups uh, groupings, but this is not the only set of hypothesized relationships for these plant groups. There are others out there, and it's good to keep that in mind. If you want to know more, it's good to go to the angiosperm phylogeny group and spend some time on the home screen reading uh, their introductory statements about their, how their ideas come to pass, uh, how they're reviewed, and uh, how they align with different philosophies for, or different hypotheses for arrangement of major plant groups. That's it for now. Happy keying.